All right, peoples, this is Ross. We're gonna talk about a, a variety of fig that I really like. Um, it's one of the more underrated, not talked about varieties that in all honesty, really deserves a hell of a lot more of attention. And it's called Hativ de Argentil. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a French fig from the Argentil region of France. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. And uh, Hativ translates to early. However, I would not classify this as an early variety, but I would classify this as a great fig for people in, um, in shorter season climates. It's gonna be about a mid-season variety, ripening around the same time as Smith, around the same time as like Villette de Bordeaux. Um, in addition to that, because I think it comes from uh, France, it's got a good uh, humidity resistance, split resistance, uh, rain resistance, uh, it rarely ever cracks. And of course, because the French care about their figs, they care about their fruit, they care about their food, it's got some incredible uh, flavor to it. It's really one of the more complex tasting figs that I've ever grown, ever. Um, it's definitely uh, got it all for the most part. It's got pretty much everything you'd want here in this climate and it tastes really good. So for that, um, you have to, I have to talk about it. I did a, a separate video where we did a nice little tasting and I was pretty upset that day because I was really stressed out. You guys might remember that video. Um, and we came out here, we just did a really quick tasting because I had to pick some figs before they spoiled and whatnot. And this was one of them that we tried and we picked two, I think that day. And they were incredible. I mean, they really just blew me away, really brightened up my day. Um, that's what I have been getting this year, basically on all of them. And I've gotten quite a bit uh, it's a very productive variety and I can't really get in here because there's the nets. These trees are so close together, but I do have it grafted, this variety. And this is where I've sort of debated this with other people for uh, a couple years now. And then I truly believe that this variety should be grafted onto a healthy rootstock and a, and a vigorous rootstock because this variety, um, the, the sources that you can find of this fig in the United States come from UC Davis. And a lot of the UC Davis figs at the USDA really just, they kind of struggle to grow and some of them have more fig mosaic virus than others. I would classify at least some of the more problematic varieties that have fig mosaic virus is Black Madeira UC Davis, Aishia Black UC Davis, which is probably the most infamous with the virus, and then this variety. So out of many, many varieties that I've ever grown, there's only three that I've really just said, wow, they really struggle with the virus. And there's been a lot of people throughout like 10 years, um, 10 years or more who have grown this variety because UC Davis used to distribute uh, all the varieties in their uh, collection out to the public. They no longer do that, but when they did, a lot of people tried this fig and it took them a really long time to get it perfect because they claim that the, the roots on this variety don't grow that well. It doesn't establish itself very well. Um, so some people, well, actually, I don't even know if anyone really recommended that I graft it, but I decided that, well, when I try this variety, I'm gonna graft it. I'm gonna put it onto a nice rootstock because I had actually the prior year of growing this variety. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what happened. So I received this variety. I, I purchased a tree from somebody and it grew on its own roots and it didn't grow very well. It really wasn't a great grower. So then I said to myself, well, it's probably one of those varieties. If you just do the research on it, it's probably just one of those that should be grafted like Aishia Black and probably even like Black Madeira UC Davis. Even Coldenon Blanc is a really good one that should be grafted as well. So I just, did, I did that. And I had a, a, a Tiv de Argentile that was one year older on its own roots versus one that was grafted that was a year younger. And the tree that was a year younger, at least grafted, I mean, maybe you could say it was the same age. It wasn't necessarily the most oldest, healthiest, most vigorous rootstock I had, that's for sure. But you could make an argument, I guess, that 
maybe they were the same age, but the grafted tree outperformed um, the ungrafted tree on its own roots significantly. Um, not only did it outproduce it, but it didn't um, drop figs. The grafted tree rarely, if ever, dropped some figs. Um, it produced a higher quality fruit. Um, everything about it was superior in so many ways that I decided last year I was going to sell the original Hatib de Argentile that I had that was not grafted. And I sold it to somebody. And um, the reason why I still believe that there's a chance that it could do well on its own roots is that I actually cut it back pretty significantly. And by doing some of that rejuvenation pruning that we talk about really in a few videos now that we've done, um, I am really confident that that tree is then gonna send up a sucker or a lot healthier growth that's not gonna have as much of the virus that I think is within this particular variety. And therefore that person should end up having a, a reasonably productive tree over the long, the long term. Um, so I don't think it's a complete waste for that person. Um, and I don't think necessarily you have to graft this variety, but I recommend it. Because like, you, like I said, you should either be doing one of two things. You should have either be rejuvenation pruning it or you should be grafting it. For me, I'm going to skip a couple years. I have some rootstock set aside already. Um, I, maybe I'll do a couple Ishia black grafts depending on how good that fruit ends up being. But next year, what I'm going to do is actually graft a lot of these. Um, I may root one or two to actually put one in the ground. And I would, believe it or not, um, I probably would, I sort of regret even selling that tree um, that I sold last year uh, that I bare rooted for somebody. But because I would have, I would have probably would have just cut it back like I did. And then I would have planted it in the ground and it probably would have recovered really nicely and put out some nice growth. I would be really interested to see how this one does in the ground, ungrafted. Um, and I just would like to see how it does in the ground in general because it does so well in a pot when grafted that I don't wanna necessarily have this variety exclusively in a pot and that's it. I wanna be able to, to eventually move away from these potted trees and have the majority of them in the ground. So um, another interesting point about it is that my friend Doug, years ago, um, Doug is a friend of mine who flew in to the Long Island Fig Festival, who lives in California. He brought in all these varieties for us to try that were grown and caprified in California, and it really blew us away of how good they were. He brought some Thermalito. We did the Thermalito tasting on the channel, and as well as some other tastings that we did. He he let me try a caprified and California grown black Madeira, an unknown pastillier. Um, I tried so many varieties that day that were just out of this world. And this is one that he didn't bring to the festival. I don't think he brought it, but he didn't shut up about it when I, when I, um, when basically I had interviewed him, I interviewed him and, and just kind of was wondering in that video, what it's like growing figs in California. And you can actually watch that video where he states, this is his favorite variety. And what was he gonna do with it? He was gonna graft as many as he could. And um, so we're sort, we were sort of on the same page back then. This was like 2017, so three years ago. And um, yeah, I've just sort of am catching up now to Doug because I've realized just how amazing this fig actually is in terms of its flavor. I always thought it had potential, but this fig does take a number of years, guys, before it can really establish itself, um, even for it to mature, even when it's grafted. So this is a variety that you really gotta be patient with. And unfortunately, if you don't graft it, I think it takes a little bit longer, but I'm now three years in with this tree since I grafted it in 2018, so 2018, 2019, now 2020. And we have some of the best fruits I've ever had off of this tree uh, and in general. So this to me is a five out of five. I'm gonna cut it open now and show you guys the inside. This one hopefully is gonna be at the, high, the higher quality that I'm used to. Just simply because it's been a bit colder here, but 
you can really see the inside there. I'm gonna zoom in for you guys and get a nice, nice photo. It looks pretty good, huh? We're not in the most light. Let's see if we can get some light. There we go. Now I've described this fig as having a cherry flavor in the past. And uh, it certainly has some acidity to it. It has an acidic bite that um, you don't find in many other figs, at least grown here. Um, you would find that probably in more figs in you know, warmer climates, but this one has an acidity and a, almost a cherry-like flavor that really sets itself apart. It has a very thick and dense texture. And one last point about this variety before I eat it is that I had two varieties last year. One was called um, Rubato, Fico Rubato, which actually is Verde Paso. It's no longer Rubato. Uh, uh, the person, Sergio, who actually um, introduced Rubato to the United States recently came out on Facebook and said that uh, it's no longer Rubato, it's actually Verde Paso, which I actually have sold a couple Verde Passos to people, actually given people some Verde Passos. So that is the same fig as what everybody thought was Rubato, but in reality, Sergio says that uh, the Rubato he has not yet, uh, I guess, released to anybody or has grown. I don't, I don't know the exact, I don't know what is going on with Rubato, but Rubato has a cherry-like flavor there's also a variety that I hold dearly called uh, Cavalieri, another, another cherry uh, fig that's also from Italy. And I think I still have a Cavalieri tree back there that uh, I think I lost the tag on it, to be honest with you. But I think that's Cavalieri. Regardless, I love that variety. Um, it just was very difficult for me, I think, because you, I like that cherry flavor, but I'm not in love with it. This Hatib de Argentile is a little bit less on the cherry front compared to the other two, I find. Um, but it had a similar enough flavor profile that this fig just outperforms the both of them significantly enough to where it doesn't make sense for me in this climate to have Cavalieri, uh, to have um, Rubato. And honestly, I was never able to really ripen a perfectly Verde Peso slash Rubato because it is a late fig. It doesn't do well in our, our fall weather. You know, as this fig here, it's been 41 degrees outside and it's ripening pretty well. So this is the one that I went with. Out of all those interesting little flavor, cherry flavor profiles that you can find, this one I think was the king of that and this is why I chose it. Um, but again, I don't think it's nearly as cherry, at least here, as Cavalieri and uh, Rubato could be. Well, that one actually is very cherry. Yeah, that's really good. It's, it's so dense. It's so thick. Actually, I just said that whole thing and I'm totally just saying that's not true because this one really does taste like a cherry and it really has that acidity to it. And I think it gets more cherry maybe as it gets colder. Um, this fig is literally, it's perfect, man. This is so good. Um, easily the most complex fig I think I've ever grown. That I've ever ripened here, let's say that. It has a real amazing cherry flavor and berry flavor that um, is not nearly as intense in other varieties that I grow. Um, some of the interesting more berry flavors, I guess, are like Verdino del Nord and, and uh, the Col de Doms and Black Madeira. This one's very, very berry and in a berry that is not common. It's not uh, something that many people have really ever tried. So if you're looking for something different, this is a good choice, but I'll tell you what, um, this variety um, is just, it's just a fantastic variety, even if it's not something different. 
you know. Um, forget about the whole diff. Let, let, let's find something different. You know, this was like in itself a fantastic, fantastic variety that again I highly recommend for any climate. It does well in the super, super hot heat of California when caprified. It does well here in my crappy climate. This fig I, I believe will do any do well anywhere, um, and it should do well anywhere if you can get it to ripen in your climate. Um, so thank you guys here for watching this, uh, this episode, this little video. Really happy to, um, to actually showcase this one, especially now that I've had it for a number of years. And um, I know if someone's gonna ask, but I don't really have any cuttings of this available. I'm gonna be taking minimal amount of cuttings to then graft other trees to then have them in pots. And I, you know, I, I kind of think of this variety in the same way I think of Smith, by the way. I'll leave you guys with that, is that Smith has got more of that complex complexity to it, a little bit of acidity, a good amount of berry flavor that other varieties may not have. Um, this one's right up there, but a little bit more acidic and, and that cherry flavor to go along with it. But otherwise, they're very similar figs. And I wouldn't necessarily be like, oh, I gotta have both. You know, I would very easily be comfortable having either Hative, the Argentile, or Smith. And um, so far, I'm not really sure which one's gonna be better. I think actually Hative, I'm leading, I'm leaning towards Hative being the better choice because I can't really plant Smith here in the ground anyway. It seems like it doesn't perform well when you prune it very hard. Whereas you could prune the hative and it would do well, you know. It doesn't mind a canopy that's not, uh, that's, that's quite dense. Whereas the Smith, you really have to spread out the canopy. You really don't want to prune it all that much. Um, you know, in terms of productivity, hative has definitely got its number. But is that going to be the same, you know, result for the future? I don't know. I think that's... Uh, at least it's an interesting thought of like which one would I rather have. Maybe one of them will work itself out in the ground and that would phase the other one out. But um, for the meantime, um, I'm not entirely sure which one I'd rather have. And they're, I would say they're rather similar. So hit that subscribe button for me, guys. We'll see you soon, all right? Take care and uh, yeah, we'll see you guys for the next video.